Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Muller. I'm uh, with NASDAD on our drug user health team based in St. Pete, Florida. Um, NASDAD works with um, HIV and viral hepatitis programs at health departments, as well as syringe services programs and other harm reduction organizations across the country, providing training and technical assistance to drug user health programs and other harm reduction efforts. Um, today, we are joined by Sarah and Leslie Marie from the University of Washington. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to them in just a minute. Um, we, and, and we partner with the University of Washington as part of our, um, as part of the National Harm Reduction Technical Assistance Center. Um, just a few housekeeping things, and then I will turn it over to our UW folks. Um, if there are any like questions throughout the presentation and stuff, you guys can put them in the chat. Me and Juan from NASDAQ, who's also on the call, will be monitoring the chat. Um, so feel free to put questions in the chat throughout the presentation or let us know if you like can't hear us or something like that. Um, and we also have some time at the end for some question and answer and discussion about 10 minutes ish. Um, so there will be time for that at the end as well. And um, I think that's it. I will hand it over to Sarah and Leslie Marie. Hello, I'm going to speak for just a second and then I will share my screen. So um, I am Leslie Marie Buer. I am a TA provider with University of Washington and I am based in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, Sarah, do you want to do a quick intro before I? Oh, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Deutsch. I'm also a TA provider with the National Harm Reduction TA Center housed at University of Washington and we focus on monitoring and evaluation. Um, I'm based in Seattle, Washington. Thank you. All right, and I should be uh, sharing my screen, except one second. Sorry about this. I guess one other housekeeping question, are we sending slides to folks after um, the meeting? Or will they be available? We'll be, yeah, so we'll be sending out the guidance that is being launched today, as well as slides after this. Um, so everybody can expect to receive that if you have to leave early or anything like that. Cool. And we can post it on NASA's website as well with the webinar recording for everyone as well. So thank Great. you. And if folks want to introduce themselves in the chat, feel free. We don't really have enough time to do like uh, introductions of everyone, but feel free to do so. Okay, I think it's finally working and where it should be. Um, so again, I am Leslie Marie Buer. I am um, I'm based in Knoxville. And in the previous uh, year before this, I was in direct service. And in that, as part of that role in direct service, I um, I worked a lot with syringe coverage, and we used that indicator to try to advocate for uh, more syringes that were um, coming to our harm reduction program, so we could get people who um, participants more syringes. And that was just sort of an internal um, conversation we were having of trying to delegate more of the budget to syringes. And we use syringe coverage to advocate for that. And so syringe coverage can be a little bit complicated, but I sort of sat with it for a few years and we are trying to boil it down to make it more usable for folks at SSPs. So we're doing this webinar, webinar which will be recorded. We will have uh, slides that we will put up and then also on our website, we have written guidance that goes over all of this in great detail and also an example Excel file that has sort of the cal calculations you could use to um, plug numbers in uh, to get syringe coverage. And so this is our whole team. Um, they've all written and given feedback on this. And uh, again, Sarah and I are doing this today. And then I'm gonna pass it back over to Sarah to talk about uh, needs-based uh, distribution and the evidence behind that. And the reason we're talking about that with syringe coverage is because uh, syringe coverage can be used uh, to argue for needs-based uh, syringe distribution. Okay, sure, yeah. 
Um, so the next slide is actually just going to go over some housekeeping details that we already covered. Um, but for those of you just joining, Les and Marie, could you advance the slide? Um, yeah, for those of you just joining, we are recording. Um, as you probably saw, we're going to post it on our website. NASDAQ's also going to post it on theirs. Um, and then we'll also send out slides and then the guidance that this webinar is launching, which Leslie Marie just mentioned. Um, and then NASDAQ's doing the chat monitoring. So um, they'll be uh, reading questions if you guys have any. Um, and we'll make sure that there's a little bit of time for like live discussion and stuff. Um, so the next slide just goes over the outline for what we'll be covering today. Um, and as Leslie Marie said, we'll start with the needs, needs based distribution um, kind of overview. Many of you are probably familiar with the evidence base, just if you've been in harm reduction for a while, right? Like a lot of um, good practices documents have been released, but we kind of realized as we were putting together the syringe coverage um, kind of guidance documents that there was this unspoken kind of um, uh, concept that we were working with that the under the shared understanding that needs based syringe distribution um, supports kind of the needs of people who use drugs has to be kind of like everybody needs to be bought into that in order um, for kind of this guidance to make sense. So if you can just advance the slide. What we mean when we talk about needs based syringe distribution is a policy where an SSP provides as many syringes as are requested by a participant, regardless of their reason. Um, so this is different from models, of course, where um, folks need to return used syringes in order to get new ones, but it's also different from programs that might have a maximum number of syringes that they distribute per encounter, whether it be for any number of constraints or reasons. Um, and the impact of needs-based distribution is the reduced likelihood of or need for syringe reuse and syringe sharing, as well as increased secondary distribution um, to folks who may not be able to access your program either in person or by mail for reasons um, of, you know, whether it be transportation, whether it be stigma, or for um, a myriad number of other reasons. Um, and then one of the things that comes up a lot about returning syringes just kind of in terms of feedback that we get from participants is that mandating return um, can increase criminal risk of criminalization. So in um, environments where carrying used syringes uh, could still be illegal due to residue within the syringe, um, requiring the return of syringes in certain situations can be dangerous, especially, um, you know, for folks who are uh, traveling long distances. So it might make sense for them to return syringes all at once during a more safe, um, a more safe situation for them, or to return to a different place other than the syringe service program. So if there's a disposal kiosk or a pharmacy that accepts used syringes, um, they don't need to hang on to them until their next visit to the syringe service program. Next slide. So while that is the evidence-based best practice and all kinds of documentation and guidance says so, we say so, we also are very hyper aware that barriers to needs-based distribution exist um, and that there are a number of factors that kind of prevent programs from implementing this best practice. Um, and so we wanted to talk about three main ones and we're gonna focus kind of quickly on the first and then move into the third and then talk about how we address the third using syringe coverage. So the first one is that political and community concerns related to syringe litter and syringe disposal can really heavily influence whether a program um, or a program decides to offer needs-based distribution or whether um, you know, they're authorized to do so um, by local or state uh, regulation. Um, and you know, while needs-based distribution is rooted in the evidence, it's peer-reviewed, um, it can be difficult to dissuade folks of the belief that uh, syringe litter may be increased by using a needs-based model, um, using research and evidence. So we, want, we did want to spend just a quick second on some alternate approaches that are not rooted in the evidence 
um, even though you know we're putting out a summary of the evidence for you all because it can be valuable for us to really be familiar with the messaging. Um, and so we have two kind of recommendations that are just really practical for folks who are engaging with the community about their concerns about syringe litter, um, which are on the next two slides. So the first one that we recommend is using positive framing. Um, so when talking about needs-based distribution, to some extent, we recognize that there may be a need to already have some level of buy-in for the importance of harm reduction. Um, but you may be operating um, within an environment where people say, okay, like, yes, I believe that certain service programs are important, but they really need to be one for one. Uh, because if you don't mandate return, um, then, people will be encouraged to dispose in a public place. Um, and so that can really put us in a position where we're feeling defensive and like we need to um, kind of come at this from a place of like, well, no, it's not, right? So I definitely hear people say, needs-based syringe distribution does not lead to increased syringe litter or some variation on that. Um, we recommend using positive framing because it creates space for a dialogue and it's also less difficult to be like, am not, am too, right? Kind of that like, conflict type space. Um, so just consider the difference between what I just shared and the statement needs-based syringe distribution helps to ensure participant needs are met while providing safe disposal education and easy to access sharps disposal. Um, so you're kind of like preventing that, um, that argument space while not appearing defensive by using positive framing. And then our other kind of suggestion uh, for folks. And this one can be um, challenging when you feel like there's um, resistance to the types of um, you know, beliefs that you hold. On the next slide is about um, meeting people where they are. Um, and you know, as harm reductionists, this is a really familiar concept, but it can be difficult to apply when you're in a situation where um, you're having kind of like an ideological debate with somebody about, um, you know, people who use drugs or your program. Um, but we do recommend applying it because people who are concerned about syringe litter are often very concerned about needle stick injury. And that comes from a place of fear, right? We cover in the document, and many of you are probably already aware that there has not been any re recorded uh, transmission of HCV or HIV via community acquired needle stick injury. So the definition of a community acquired needle stick injury is something that happens um, not in the household and not um, during work, so occupational exposure. Um, and the reason for that is partly because a lot of times these injuries are um, with, you know, kind of older syringes, um, or the puncture is not like deep enough or the plunger is not, um, oh no, I'm going to screw up whatever verb I'm looking for, but the plunger is not pushed um, in the event of these needle stick injuries. So um, whatever residual blood is in the syringe doesn't enter the bloodstream of the person who's injured. But that does not mean that the fear is not valid. Um, sorry, can you go back to the last slide, Wilson Marie? Yeah, so um, that doesn't mean the fear is not valid um, because folks who have, um, you know, this fear are coming from a place where that's like the, the kind of frame of reference they're operating from. So you can validate that and be like, I understand that this is scary, right? Um, and then sort of move into problem solving once you've validated that, right? Like you can offer the resources and then you can also explore shared goals. Um, so you can say it's absolutely important that we address syringe litter. Um, and again, remember that like the evidence might not be effective here, but you might be able to say, right, that like syringe litter occurs in every environment um, and communities with syringe service programs, just whether or not they're needs based, tend to have lower rates of syringe litter than those without. Um, and that you are aligned on the goal of preventing needle stick injury, preventing uh, litter, and where can you um, where can you guys align about what should be done to address syringe litter? So that's our guidance, kind of about addressing these political and community concerns. 
but our guidance is all our guidance kind of feeds into some other barriers to needs based distribution. Um, so there are two other two main barriers. One is budget constraints, which are very real um, and different climates have different availability to resources um, that can that can facilitate access to enough syringes to be able to implement a needs based syringe model. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is internal policy. Um, so some folks uh, programs operate on a one for one or one for one plus model. Um, just because of internal uh, reasons and internal factors. Um, and so we did wanna talk mainly about how we're gonna use syringe coverage to address that barrier. Um, but before we go into the rest of the webinar, I did just wanna provide an opportunity to fo for folks to chime in. Um, we definitely recognize that our experiences are not comprehensive. So does anyone wanna share um, what they have done to accomplish a transition from one for one or one for one plus policies to a needs based distribution model. Or talk about um, their experiences of barriers if they're different or similar to what I've shared so far. Yeah, Heidi. Um, <clears throat> when I started working in syringe services and uh, 1999, um, the agency policy was one for one, though they were, um, we, we just, we used community input and, uh, sort of, um, the outcomes that people were facing and, and the challenges that they were going through to maintain enough, uh, use supplies to return to get enough uh, clean supplies and the fact of the matter being that um you know if you if you start with like a 10 pack on a person's first visit they'll there's no way for them to go beyond that right and uh, a person is 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 going to do what they need to do um and so we you know the the other person in in the program with me um we just kept going back to um to leadership and saying that this a was not a best practice and we could point at uh, the harm reduction coalition for that but b this is what uh, the people who we deal with directly are are facing and the challenges they're facing and why it it's unreasonable to ask a person to bring collect and bring in x number of syringes uh just so they can get more services and it's you know it's coercive which is against harm reduction in every way wow yes thank you so much heidi i think that's exactly it right it's about why would we ask folks to increase the risk when they're already um facing criminalization facing the need to share syringes why as harm reduction programs would we be um, sort of exacerbating that problem? So thank you so much for saying that. Anyone else? Okay, something coming in from the chat um, from Keith. Uh, our public health department issued an information notice on how community-based orgs can apply to become a certified SSP. And the information notice includes language that syringe distribution should be needs-based. So it's in writing from the public health department for orgs, uh, but this is external, not internal. Right, so guidance from um, sort of regulating authorities can be really important for public buy-in. Um, even if folks, you know, may not like, values-based degree, right? Saying, okay, well, this is in the regulation. So this is how we, um, you know, will operationalize this recommendation. I appreciate that, Keith, thank you. Um, that's awesome that that was your public health department's guidance, like making it needs space. Yeah, I mean, I bet all of us would love to see that. So thank you. <laughs> I have the, we have the opposite situation in Florida where I am. <laughs> Um, so yeah, definitely feel everyone's struggles with it.
Okay, awesome. Well, I hope that you all get to continue this conversation because I know that hearing actual examples of success is probably the single most valuable um, part of this webinar for you all. Um, and so yeah, keep them coming in the chat. I'll hand it over to Leslie Marie. Okay, yes, and um, in Tennessee and surrounding states, that is the goal of most of the outward facing goal of most public health is this one for one idea, which we know is not evidence based, but um, yeah, it public health turns political oftentimes. So we are just, I'm going to introduce syringe coverage and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of like how to actually collect it. Um, so we're talking about syringe coverage for an individual participant, not an entire population of people who use drugs. That can be calculated, but I think that's beyond the scope of the vast majority of syringe service programs to be able to do, because really you need an, an epidemiologist, I feel like, or someone who is, is really good at um, calculating populations of of people who are criminalized. And um, I know most SSPs, we don't have those, those resources. So this is really talking about, again, an individual participant. And these estimates are for people who are currently injecting drugs. And of course, we love people who use drugs in all sorts of ways. And we think folks should have access to supplies to use drugs, whichever way they want, whether that's syringes or, or pipes or um, safer snorting supplies. But this webinar is focused on people who inject and really our goal here is to help SSPs and people who work with SSPs understand how individual syringe coverage could be used and to understand how to collect and analyze the data to estimate syringe coverage. And so when talking about what is syringe coverage, it's an indicator that can help SSPs estimate if people who inject drugs have enough syringes to reduce risk of infection and vein damage. And really the ultimate goal is to have enough syringes so that everyone can use a new syringe for each injection. And syringe coverage can be calculated, again, for those large populations, but that's not what we're doing today. We're focusing on the participants of one program, or it can also be calculated um, for subgroups of participants of a program. So for example, you could be thinking about um, syringe coverage of participants who are housed versus participants who are unhoused and understanding if you are not, if your program's not really meeting the needs of people, of folks who are unhoused, but maybe you're doing a pretty good job of meeting the needs of folks who are people who are uh, folks who are housed. So it's really looking at those subgroups of participants as well. And again, why would this be important? It, it, it's good for advocating for needs-based, um, whether that's internally or for external policies. Um, and we know that SSPs in the US are incredibly underfunded and often can't meet people's needs to use a new syringe for every injection. Um, so we have a lot of inadequate syringe coverage in this country or not having enough syringes. And we know that's associated with syringe sharing and syringe reuse. And of course, syringe sharing is concerning because um, particularly of HCV, HIV and other infections, but also syringe reuse is uh, concerning because of uh, bacterial infections and also um, for vein damage. So syringe coverage can help show the gap between what people need and what they're actually getting and how these gaps and differences might be affected by demographics like gender, uh, age, race, ethnicity, and housing status. Okay, and so in thinking about individual level syringe coverage, it's often reported as the number of new syringes provided to a person who injects drugs divided by the estimated number of injections or attempted injections during a specified time period. And we also often think about that in terms of like 30 days or maybe a month or four weeks, sort of whatever time period works with uh, in staff brains and also in, um, works with participants' understandings of time. And this individual level syringe coverage can help answer a few questions. Again, is the program meeting participant needs for syringes and is the program meeting participants needs equitably? Um, but there's limitations to this indicator. You know, this is an estimate. Um, it is based on people's, people's memory. And we know that self-reported data from people who use drugs and inject drugs has shown to be reliable and valid um, as much as anybody else's, but it's still based on memory. 
and it can also be based on the relationship with the person collecting the survey. So if, if it's someone you know and have good rapport with who is asking you how many times a week you inject drugs, you might feel more comfortable answering that question than if it's just some rando volunteer you've never seen before, right? And we also know that this is an estimate because people's lives and drug use fluctuate. So what might be enough syringes one day or one week or one month may not be enough the next month because our circumstances change. And so I'll talk a little bit more about getting into estimating individual syringe coverage. And local context does matter. Uh, um, so local context outside of a pro program's control may affect syringe coverage. And some of the issues we've seen in the literature or we've also seen in our work that affects syringe coverage is, you know, are there restriction, restrictions requiring one for one exchange of syringes? Are there caps on the number of syringes that can be exchanged? Like you can only exchange 60 or 100 or whatnot. Um, are the police going around confiscating a lot of syringes? Is there a lot of policing in around in and around SSP locations? Are there a lot of sweeps where people who are unhoused are losing all of their belongings once a week? You know, this is going to affect how many syringes people need. There may also be local trends of transitioning um, to injecting or transitioning from injecting to smoking and snorting. So all of this is going to affect uh, syringe coverage. That's why I, I will talk about this a few times, but we really encourage uh, pilot testing and thinking about any indicator but also including syringe coverage. So if you're thinking about collecting syringe coverage, all of the questions you're using to collect that data, all the processes you're using to collect and analyze that data should be run by staff and volunteers and participants and participant advisory boards to make sure those questions make sense for the people who are collecting the data and for the people who um, the data are being collected from. And so I'm about to go into this whole big thing of using a lot of quantitative data, but there's also some easier ways to do this using uh, informal qualitative data. And as a PA center, we have some guidance around informal qualitative data. But there's, there's ways for staff just to keep notes, and we encourage notes to be anonymous and be identified if people are keeping them. But you know, if you have, if you're a staff and you have five people who come in in a day who say that they that you are not providing them enough syringes because your cap is 100 or whatever, you can even just keep a tally of how many people are coming in and saying, hey, you're not giving enough, enough, enough syringes. And by the end of a week, if that's 100 people, I mean, that's something to tell people. Or people might be telling you their stories of how, look, you gave me 60 syringes last week. I Our camp was swept the next day. I lost everything. And you know, I was left with one syringe and that's my story and, and I wasn't able to come back. And so it's, it's a way to share those stories about people not having enough supplies. Um, there's also, you know, more, that's sort of just receiving stories and writing them down as they come in. And there's also ways to use informal qualitative data is just sort of asking participants if they and their friends have enough and, and taking a tally mark of, of, of people who say they have enough or people who say they don't. And um, there's, there's one article that suggests, you know, if more than 10% of participants say they or their peers don't have enough syringes, then explore ways to increase syringe supply. So these are sort of low barrier ways to um, think about syringe coverage that don't involve all the data collection I'm about to get into. But if you feel like you have the resources to do um, the data collection, it can give some interesting um, results. So this is the basic indicator of syringe coverage. So you're looking at the number of someone's visits to the SSP in the last 30 days times the number of syringes that they kept for themselves, they didn't give out to other people from the last SSP visit divided by the number of injection, injections in the last 30 days times 100. And in a few minutes, I'll get into some different ways to ask about each of those measures. Most of this, um, the really the beginnings of thinking about syringe coverage came from the article cited here. It's Blusenthal, Anderson et al, 2007. But there's been a lot of work done um, both by Blusenthal and by groups in Australia and really globally on syringe coverage since this paper came out. And I have all of those cited in uh, the written guidance we have. There's a lot out there to find different examples of what to, to look at. So again, for SSP visits, that's the first uh, 
measure. The participant is asked how many times they came to the SSP during a specific time frame. Here it says 30 days. Maybe that doesn't make sense for folks. Maybe um, we actually stopped using 30 days because that was kind of confusing. And we kind of actually went to four weeks that made more sense in people's heads. Is like, how many times have you seen us in the last four weeks? I've seen other people ask, how many times have you come and seen us in the last um, month? So again, pilot testing, this is where all pilot testing comes in. The syringe acquisition slash sort of secondary syringe distribution question asks how many syringes people receive for themselves after their last SSP visit. And this is different from how many syringes someone received, received at the last visit because people often pick up syringes for other people. Um, for injection frequency, people are asked how often they inject during a specific time frame. Again, you can ask 30 days. That may, not, that may be really hard to think about for a lot of folks. Um, so you might ask about the last week or the last day and, and go from there. Again, we will get for that, to that in a second. So there's also some additional uh, variables that you can throw into this equation. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that now. It's, it's explained in detail in the written guidance, but I'd like to get sort of a hold on the basic indicator before getting into this too much, but I'll, I'll talk about it just briefly. So two of these variables I think that apply, could possibly apply in the US. One is the number of syringes obtained from other sources. So if you actually care about what, where people are getting their syringes and you know, if they're getting a lot from other sources, you could ask this question. And it really only makes sense if you have large numbers of participants regularly accessing syringes through a source outside of an SSP. Um, and maybe this is vending machines or online retailers where I'm at in Knoxville, we don't have any vending machines and it's very hard to get online retailers to send syringes to our state. So that's not really an issue for us, but it might be in other areas. The, the next variable is the number of syringes needed to use a new syringe for each injection or attempted injection. So it's not just how many times have you injected in the last you know, day or week or whatnot, it's how many times have you injected or attempted to inject. And so, because we know that a lot of folks might, especially with a long history of injection, injection or uh, low access to SSPs through their injecting career, may need multiple syringes for each successful injection. And so it's, it's asking people how many new syringes um, need in a day to use a new syringe for each attempted injection and each successful injection. And so do you know if, you know, every time you inject, are you usually having to use attempted two or three times, would you need two or three syringes for each successful injection? And this is really useful, again, in areas where, where folks um, are having that issue. And again, that's where local context and pilot testing come in. There's also additional indicators you might wanna think about asking along with um, syringe coverage. So this would not go in the syringe coverage equation we just looked at a few minutes ago. These are just going separately and it can be a way to group different people. And so thinking about demographics and structural vulnerability, there have been indicators that have been significantly associated with decreased individual syringe coverage. And this includes black and Latina, Latinx, race and ethnicity, younger age and being unhoused. So those might be important demographics to look at when looking at syringe coverage to see if you're equitably serving participants. Um, and there, you might look at drug use characteristics. I personally hate asking this question, um, but it, it could be important locally. It could be important to participants or a participant advisory board. And the reason you might ask people about which drugs they're injecting is to make sure you're adequately serving people no matter which drugs they inject, because lower syringe coverage has been associated with injecting stimulants and with injecting fentanyl. And again, pilot tests all these questions uh, with participants, with a participant advisory board, and they really depend on local context um, about what the questions will be and about what the answers will be and which answers would, might be important and which might not be. So we'll talk a little bit about data collection. And first and foremost, I wanna talk about ethical data collection because before we think about any data collection, we need to be thinking about this. So we encourage programs to collect data to make programs and services better and not just collect data because you're curious. If, if 
you're asking a question that's not actionable, it's not clear why you would be asking that question in the context of program evaluation. Um, and if there's, if there's no way, so for example, if there's no way you can increase the number of syringes folks are getting, then why are you collecting data on syringe coverage? It's taken up a lot of people's time. And if, if there's absolutely no way you can increase the number of syringes you're getting, I don't quite get why you'd be asking that question. So we also want um, data collection that is culturally and structurally appropriate. So non-stigmatizing language, trauma-informed, accessible language, you know, people who inject drugs should be in, included in creating these methods. And again, it comes back to, to pilot testing. You know, questions you're asking should be reviewed by staff, by volunteers and participants. So everyone understands what's being asked. We also encourage minimalist data collection and no one should ever have to answer any questions to get services. And I also don't think um, syringe programs should have to provide uh, particular data just to get um, funding. And so that's another can of worms, but we, we encourage point in time surveys. Um, these are usually collected every one to two years. Honestly, for syringe coverage, I could see not only collecting this indicator every three to five years, just to sort of gauge where your program's at. Um, or you might wanna collect syringe coverage before or after a policy change or something like a global pandemic. So if you had syringe coverage numbers before um, something like COVID-19, it might be useful to collect them after um, to understand what's happening. Um, and again, with, with minimal data collection, if you can't use the data in program evaluation, then don't collect it or don't ask for it to be collected. Uh, in terms of compensation, you know, pay people for their time if they're filling out a survey that's not just part of routine um, everyday data collection, you know, how many syringes are you bringing back to us? If it's something like syringe coverage, we encourage people to compensate people for their time. And this, again, is not going to be with gift cards. This is usually going to be with cash, but this is important why it's good to have a uh, participant advisory board is to understand what compensation is appropriate locally. And then also um, there are concerns with privacy and security and understanding that these data need to be protected and they could harm people if, if they are not. So that's a brief intro to ethical data collection. Okay, and so I'm gonna go through each of the three measures that were in that basic syringe coverage. And again, the basic syringe coverage is number of visits to the SSP in the last 30 days times the number of syringes retained from the last SSP visit divided by the number of injections in the last 30 days. So I'm gonna go over the first one now. So you could ask this in many different ways. Again, it needs to be pilot tested for your particular location. And for SSP visits, the participant is asked how many times they came to the SSP during a specific time frame. So you want to be thinking about, are you asking about any SSP or your particular SSP? Like, how many times have you come to a SSP in the last 30 days versus how many times have you come to this particular SSP in the last 30 days? And also thinking about that time frame. What makes sense for people? 30 days, four weeks, et cetera. Moving on to the next question, um, number of syringes retained from the last SSP visit. Um, again, this is thinking about syringes people picked up that they used or kept for themselves that they didn't give away for, for other people. And again, thinking about versus any SSP versus this particular SSP and also different ways to word this. And so um, I worded it two ways here. There's 10 different ways to word this. Um, so that should be based on local context. And the last question. I think this is the hardest one to ask folks. Um, and it's really asking people how often they inject during a specific time frame. And this time frame is really important uh, here. So what's easiest for people to think about and what time frame picks up people's fluctuating lives? So it might be really hard for people to think about how many times they've injected in the last 30 days. And they might even start doing mental math immediately as you ask them that. And like, okay, I inject about 10 times a day, so 10 times 30 is 300. So do you need folks to do that mental math or can you ask a different question that might get to the same thing? So you could ask how many times do you inject drugs on a typical day? 
that's a really hard question because what what's a typical day um is a typical day right after i got my paycheck is it a weekend day is it a weekday you know people's lives fluctuate a lot so that's really hard to pick up i think what we landed on when i was in direct service was how many times do you inject drugs in a typical week because that kind of at least picks up the fluctuations throughout a week and also is pretty e easier to think about than a full 30 days. And we base everything off of a four week time period. And so we just took, okay, how many times do you inject in a typical week? Um, okay, I inject about 70 times. Then we would times that times four. And so we, we were doing that four week time period as our time frame throughout the whole equation. But again, got to find what, what works best for you and for local, local folks. And then it comes down to when data are collected. Again, syringe coverage should never be <laughs> collected at every encounter, every time you see someone. That is way too much data collection and it doesn't help, uh, in my opinion. It, it should really be collected at these point in time surveys. I think the most you would ever want to collect this indicator is annually. I think that's even really kind of too much, but I think again, every three to five years or before or after policy changes. So we recommend point in time surveys. Point in time surveys collect data during a limited time and allow SSPs to ask a standard set of questions from a portion of their participants. So for example, you might say, okay, we are gonna collect information about syringe coverage in August of 2023. We're going to do it for the month and then we're not going to and we're going to talk to every participant who comes in who is willing to ask these questions and then we're not going to talk about it with participants again for two years. Um, and so you, and you might again have that time frame we're going to talk to everyone in a month or you might have we want to we know we serve um, this many participants a year and so we want to talk to 10 percent of participants um, that we generally serve in a year, or we want to talk to at least 100 participants or whatever that might make be for your program. And really the beauty of a point in time survey is it limits the data burden on staff and on participants, but it provides a good snapshot of the participant population. Um, and again, syringe coverage changes through time in the same place and with the same folks, so it may be worth collecting, you know, every once in a while, not, not too much. And we are also uh, hosting a webinar and we'll, we're launching a toolkit for SSPs interested in implementing a point in time survey and materials were adapted from that after being developed and tested during the learning collaborative with seven SSPs. So we will have a lot of material about point in time surveys coming out soon if you all are interested in that. So moving from data collection just to some basic data analysis. Um, let's say Marie, we do have yeah. a question in the chat about the equation. Yes. Um, so the question is, how do you account for patient or patients or participants who don't stay in the program for the duration of time? For example, a survey every three to five years may capture an individual only one time. Yeah, and so I think for this, it's really thinking about the, the group of individuals who are, are just thinking about your participant population. And so I'm not sure necessarily what you do with just an individual. I'm, I'm no, I don't think following an, an individual, we are, we are calculating this on an individual level to get a snapshot of all the participants that come to you. And so you, you calculate this so we understand how many injections someone's, someone's done and, and so forth. So you can get a, a good number, but then you're grouping that number together with a bunch of different participants, right? So you're being able to get an estimate of how many participants have inadequate or adequate syringe coverage. I think following a particular person with like a unique identifier code through years and years of services, I don't think that's feasible and I'm not sure the worth of it either. Um, and we do have some good research that I don't think is necessary for an SSP, some academic based research of showing that individuals do um, fluctuate through time, but I'm not sure the use of a particular program showing that one participant is fluctuating through time. And I will have to think about that. And maybe if others can think about what the utility of that might be. Um, 
I think the greater utility is understanding if you are getting your participants in general enough syringes and also subgroups of participants. I think it would be very hard to try to focus on every single individual who comes to see you and making sure that one person. So yes, um, let's think about that through the rest of this and maybe we can have a discussion at the end of what the utility of that would be. And really, I think if we could all use this to advocate for all of us having needs based, that would be great. Um, so if people are coming and being able to get as many syringes as they say they need, that's the goal, right? And then I think looking at these subgroups can show where more outreach needs to happen. And so in terms of looking at people who are out housed and unhoused, if you are serving people who are housed adequately, but not serving people who are unhoused, I think that shows that there needs to be more outreach effort into encampments or um, other places where folks who are unhoused are in your community. Um, if it's showing that people who are Latina are not getting enough services, does that show that, like, do you have all your materials translated um, into appropriate languages? And are you going to those communities? So I, I think that's the utility of it, more than looking at each individual participant through time. Um, Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about target syringe coverage. So calculating syringe coverage may be completed with statistical software and a spreadsheet or with pen and paper. I'm going to go through what it would look like to use Excel and with a pen and paper. And then I also want to talk, talk about target syringe coverage. So we encourage SSPs to set a target for syringe coverage for their participants, such as 100%, 125%, or 150% coverage. So 100% coverage means that someone has a new syringe for each injection. 150% coverage, on the other hand, means that people have sort of more than one new syringe for each injection. So if you inject 10 times a day, 150% coverage would mean that you had 15 syringes for that day. Um, and you can have be thinking about short versus long-term goals, like maybe we are doing not a great job with uh, syringe coverage because we are so underfunded that it's hard for us to get enough syringes out to people. And maybe only like 60% of the people we see or maybe even 40% of the people we see have adequate syringe coverage. So maybe our goal is to get 60% um, of people up to 100% of coverage. Or maybe we're a really well-funded program we think that a lot of people are getting that 100% coverage. So we wanna make sure that um, everyone who's coming to see us is up to that 150% coverage. And so why would you want more than 100% coverage? So 100% is often seen as a US public health goal, but going above 100% estimated coverage may be important to meet participant needs. So people may need 125% or 150% of coverage because syringes are confiscated by police or easily lost, especially for people who are unstably housed. Again, other people may need more than one syringe for each successful injection and aiming for a higher coverage level helps ensure that people have syringes to account for these situations. And again, it's all about local context. So going back to this basic equation analysis, um, we have number of visits to SSP in the last 30 days time the, times the number of syringes retained from the last SSP visit divided by the number of injections the last 30 days times 100. For the purposes of this presentation, we tend to categorize people with under 100% coverage as having inadequate syringe coverage and people with 100% and greater coverage as having adequate syringe coverage. But again, you can move that number to 125% or whatever your program is focused on. So this is an example um, of a spreadsheet and I have the formulas type below it. We also have an example spreadsheet. I also have this in the written guidance. Um, in this particular version of the spreadsheet, I am not using participant IDs. If you use participant you know, unique identifiers, you can use them as you're collecting 
syringe coverage, but if you're not already using uh, unique identifiers, I, you don't have to. Um, and so as you're doing a point in time survey, if you have a small enough program, you're probably going to remember who did or not did not fill out the survey. You can ask people if they filled out the point in time survey. And I mean, you risk having duplicate data if you do not have a unique identifier, but I think that risk is worth it to keep people anonymous if you are not already using a unique identifier in your program. So in this table, I do not have uh, the unique identifier here. It's just um, three participants data. So you look, if you look at this, you can see the number of SSP visits um, times the syringes retained from the last SSP visit divided by the number of injections. And this person has a coverage of what is 80%. And so we would consider that inadequate syringe coverage. And I also wanna show that you can do this by hand. You don't necessarily need to do this um, formulation in an Excel file. And so you would do it by hand via this method. And again, you do this for each individual. So each row you calculate, you don't just total, like if you had 10 participants, you don't just total all of their visits, all of their syringes retained and all of their injections, and then do a number. You have to do it individually for each, each participant. Okay, and getting to reporting syringe coverage. Most SSPs who do collect this report syringe coverage as the percentage of participants who have inadequate or adequate syringe coverage. And this is what it would look like in this table. I am using a, um, a participant ID. This is the each person's coverage and this is how they're calculated as inadequate or adequate. And for this, it would be reported that two out of four or 50% of participants have inadequate syringe coverage and 50% of participants have adequate syringe coverage. And of course, I'm just showing these as examples. You never want to base a program policy on four people, right? Um, you want to have a, a lot more than this. But. And you can also um, compare syringe coverage by particular demographic structural vulnerability or drug use characteristics to examine if people are being um, served appropriately. And so if you look at this table, it shows that American Indian, Alaska Native, and Latina and Latinx participants are more likely to have inadequate syringe coverage. But these numbers just show that it's happening. They don't provide a reason why. Informal qualitative data, interviews, focus groups, having going to your participant advisory board, going to participants themselves, could be used to understand reasons why these inequities exist and may point to actions the SSP could take to address the inequities. So I'm just going to go through um, two more slides and we will get to uh, questions. So this is just an example of how you might interpret syringe coverage for funders. And I just wanna be clear that many programs in the US are likely to have large percentages of participants with inadequate syringe coverage because we are so underfunded. Um, and that is not the fault of a program, it is, the fault of not the program of, of many layers above the program. And it, you know, it reflects the stigma against harm reduction and against people who use, who inject drugs and who use drugs in this country. But I did wanna give this um, interpretation and I'll read it for you. So say this is coming from me as a program to a funder asking for more money for syringes. So during August and September of 2022, we conducted a point in time survey where 215 participants answered questions about the number of times they visited the SSP in the last 30 days, the number of syringes they retained from their last SSP visit and the number of times they inject in the last 30 days. We used participant answers to calculate syringe coverage for each participant. We found that 110 or 51.2% of participants had inadequate syringe coverage. Due to lack of funding for syringes, we have a cap where participants can only pick up 60 syringes at each visit. With the proposed funding, we will increase that cap to 100 syringes per visit. After we increase the cap, we will conduct another point in time survey in August and September of 2023 to understand if the 100 syringe cap increase increases the number of participants who have adequate syringe coverage. So this can be a way to advocate for funding for syringes in particular. So again, this is a this is a lot to get through in an hour. Um, I've been sitting with this for a while and it's complicated. I've, I've changed my understanding of it as I've, as I've used syringe coverage and how it can be useful. 
But again, we will have written guidance um, with sample questions and a sample survey, a complete survey um, that's available on the SHARP website. Um, and it, there's a whole lot of uh, other links to resources in there that you can go to if you wanna take a deep dive in this. But if you don't wanna keep, take a deep dive, I think you can shallowly wade in and use this written guidance to, to work on this. Oh, sorry. My, we have storms here all day and my computer flashed for a second. Give me one second. Okay, and there's also an example uh, Excel file. It already has data in it, but you can look at the formulas and use that formula if you all wanna do that. And again, we have it posted, um, the written guidance posted online. And if you wanna keep up with us, we have an Instagram. We also have a website. Uh, any information we have about the point in time surveys will be posted on the Instagram. And if you have further questions, you can email us at sharpta. Uh, and my personal email is just lbuer at uw.edu. And so I would be happy to look at this with your program and see if it, if it makes sense for you and how that might work. So I think, I don't know, we have time for like a few questions. I'm sorry, that was a lot to run through. Um, I think we had also talked about afterwards is taking any questions that are in the chat and um, I can answer those one by one and we can send that back out to participants or you can just email me individually, it's up to you. Um, you said lbuer at uw.edu? That is correct. Um, how often would you advise these point in time surveys to happen, once a year? I think that's oftentimes how that happens. I think Sarah can also speak more to this. Um, we, at one point, I was doing it every six months in direct service. I thought that was way too much. I would recommend every every one year or maybe every two years. Sarah, what's the norm for that, do you think? Yeah, it depends on kind of the length of your survey instrument, the capacity for staff. Um, often our guidance is based on sort of the 10 year experience in King County in Washington state um, where it's been performed biannually for over 10 years. And they've found really um, rich data that has been really beneficial to their program that can be used for two years. Um, and because it builds on itself, um, there's not a need to do it more frequently than that. Um, but, you know, there are also programs that have found great success doing it annually and, and been able to reduce their routine data collection as a result. So I think that it really is dependent on what your local context is. And if through doing an annual point in time survey, you're able to reduce routine data collection, then that's a success. Um, I don't wanna take up all the question time, but um, what do you think of the value of like tracking from month to month, uh, you know, maybe like demographic breakdown or, or stuff like that? What, do you think that that is valuable or? So um, I think there's a couple of different ways that that might happen, right? So for programs that do use unique IDs, um, you know, that would be something where they would have done an intake, potentially collecting demographic data at the first visit. And in that case, if they've collected demographic data and then they track how often that unique individual comes into their program, then they will be able to do that math, right? Because they'll say, okay, this person, who has these demographic characteristics came in six times. Um, and then also we know a proportion of the visitors who had these demographic characteristics and we can compare it. Um, what we don't recommend is that programs who don't use unique IDs collect demographics at every encounter. First of all, it's only a then it would only show you a proportion of total visits versus unique individuals. Um, and you know, we also recognize that intakes themselves can be barriers to services. Um, unique IDs can cause barriers. Um, so that's why in general, our program stays really rooted in our recommendation around point in time surveys, um, but it can be done really well and successfully um, in other methods. So we do have guidance on that same website, um, sharpta.uw.edu in our guidance and resources about how to implement unique IDs if that is the direction that your program or your state is going in. Does that help, Gabrielle? It does. And uh, 
Leslie, I will be reaching out to you more because I have uh, a lot of concerns and I don't want to take up uh, time here. But yeah, we're using the unique ID uh, system. And I have some concerns, especially being in like a southern state, like really bad politics. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to note that we're um, just about at time, um, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, we will, um, yeah, post, every, send everything out, the recording. Um, if folks have questions, um, I know Leslie and Sarah shared their information in the chat and it's still up on the screen. And we also put um, our NASA Drug User Health TA uh, email in there as well if folks if things come up and folks want to um, contact us and we can connect you guys. But yeah, I just wanted to send a huge thank you to Sarah and Leslie Marie for presenting today. Um, and we'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone for joining.